Let's join in prayer, shall we, and seek the Lord together. Our Heavenly Father, we do pause as we begin our study tonight and lift our souls unto you in heaven. Our God and Father, we thank you that we can know communion with you through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we come tonight praying that as we reflect upon truths in your word, that our hearts will be made more and more like the Lord Jesus, more and more fitted for eternal glory. We'll have a deeper confidence in our understanding of you and a greater boldness to be able to speak of you to a lost world. May your Holy Spirit come then and uh, open our minds, engrave our hearts with your truth. For we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, tonight we begin the first of three studies on the subject of the sacraments. And it's worthwhile stopping even as we begin this by thinking about three out of 33. Bill, what's your maths like? That's what, fractionally? Three out of 33 is one? Eleven. Okay, and it's worthwhile thinking one eleventh of the confession of faith in terms of chapters are devoted to the sacraments. Does that strike you as uh, maybe not disproportionate, but it is interesting, is it not? One eleventh of the, of the confession of faith. When you think, deals with practical Christianity, doctrine of God, doctrine of salvation, doctrine of the last things, one eleventh of them are devoted to the sacraments. Well, that perhaps indicates what? What do you think might, uh, that might indicate? Do you think it indicates the proportion, or at least the relative proportional significance of the sacraments in the scriptures? Do you think roughly a eleventh of the scriptures are devoted to things like baptism, Lord's Supper, etc.? No. Hamish, any idea why this might receive such prominence at this point? Yes, yeah, so because they're so contentious. <clears throat> well, because <laughs> that's one the factor in it. And certainly at the Reformation and the post-Reformation period, the whole issue of grace, sacramentarianism, that kind of thing was quite an important issue, was it not? At the Reformation, one of the critical things was, how do we receive grace from God? And in the post-Reformation era, much of the persecution and trials and sufferings that the church endured were related precisely to details of the sacraments. In uh, Switzerland in particular, many of the Anabaptists were persecuted. Many of them drowned and killed because of their position and stance on the baptism. And in England especially, and not only in England, but men like John Huss and others prior to the Reformation, suffered, were burned, imprisoned on account of their commitment to a, a different view of the sacraments to the church at large. So historically, you'd have to say sacraments have been quite a contentious issue. And that's probably why so much time is devoted to them in the confession of faith. Do you think that the Christian church today, just exactly where we are today, the evangelical church, do you think that the sacraments figure largely in the thinking, theology, and life of the church, by and large, the evangelical church? Don't think so. That'd be right. Not, not nearly as significantly as they were. I think even uh, 40, 50 years ago, there were more... Uh, fervent and heated debates, for example, between Paedobaptists and Baptistic people today than, than today. Today, not nearly so many, because by and large the Paedobaptist community has become much smaller in terms of proportions anyway. It's generally taken for granted that if you're a Christian today and you've been born again today, <clears throat> you'll be baptized as an adult. So that particular issue, except I know it varies in some communions, etc., but I think that by and large that issue is not one which is contested, debated, discussed at great length today as it was, as I say, 30, 40 years ago much more. Do you think I'm correct in saying that? Some of you are not 30, 40 years old, are you? So you can't dispute on that. Similarly, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, I think in many evangelical churches today doesn't have a very significant profile. 
people from an Anglican background will be used to celebrating the Lord's Supper how often? Weekly, right? Some Pentecostal churches today, there would still be a weekly celebration of the Lord's Supper. But again, in many Reformed Presbyterian churches, it's at the most frequent, maybe monthly, but quite often still quarterly, and in some cases still six-monthly. So just the general awareness of the profile and the significance of the sacraments in the Christian faith today, I think are not nearly as vigorous or prominent as they once were. And I think as we look at the subject tonight, many of us will notice there's at least a perspective, whether you agree with it or not, but there is a perspective that was held by the reformers that's commonly not talked about by the Christian community and church today. All right. Let's get stuck in then and look at that opening quote from Tom Wilkinson, which really just underscores what I've been saying. Sacraments have always loomed large in the discussions of the church. There have been major divisions in the church because of the differences about them. Though these may seem small matters and reason for caricature, as I say, that's generally speaking how it's viewed by many today. Small matters and people say, what in the world do people get all stewed up about those sorts of things for anyway? Yet, the deeper reason is that in properly understanding them, the very heart of the gospel is at stake. Now, I think our fathers saw that a lot more clearly than we do today. We say, what does it matter? Whether people are dunked, whether people are sprinkled, whether people are immersed, whether you do it or whether you don't do it, those sorts of things, what does it matter? As I say, the older ancients saw that the heart of the gospel was often at stake in these issues. For that reason alone, we must try to clarify their meaning and purpose. Well, tonight we're going to look at the sacraments in general. Next week we go on to have a look at baptism and the week after the Lord's Supper. But tonight it's a general look at the sacraments. And you see, I've broken the five articles of chapter 27 into four. There are five different articles in the Confessions text. I've grouped the last two. So we end up by looking at the nature and purpose of the sacraments, the sign and spiritual reality of the sacraments, or what's called sacramental union. Thirdly, the efficacy of the sacraments. How effective are they? What is the effectiveness of the sacraments connected with? And then fourthly, the number, administration, and continuity of the sacraments. That's what we end up with. So, let's kick off. And as we've noted in the other ones, we'll probably end up taking quite a bit longer with this first one, and dare I say it, even the very first opening section here, which endeavors to define the sacraments. This is going to take us probably the best part of half an hour, I think, to look at this, not intentionally delaying it. But we begin. Sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace instituted directly by God. That's how the framers of the confession saw it. They are directly instituted by God to represent Christ and his benefits and to confirm the right we have in him and also to put a visible difference between those who belong to the church and the rest of the world, and solemnly to pledge them to service for God in Christ according to his word. So basically in that first article, we've got a statement of the nature of the sacraments to begin with, and then their purpose, nature and purpose. Let's take a few minutes then to explore the nature of the sacraments. And we begin by looking at the word sacrament. And the first thing to note about this, and you'll see it in the notes, is that it doesn't actually occur in the scriptures. The word sacrament under A.1, it literally means something sacred. It's a Latin term. It is not itself a biblical word. It's much like the term trinity. It's like the term providence. It's a term that theologians use to denote realities that are contained in the scriptures, but it's not actually a biblical word. It has, as we've got here, two primary applications in its original uh, meaning, if you like. First is, originally it meant a thing set apart 
as, it should be not just a, but set apart as sacred. In uh, older and medieval and Latin usage as well, that which was sacred or sacral does mean devoted to a god or devoted to that which is connected with religious activities or service. So it did mean a sacrament, something sacred. And uh, it was used in particularly in terms of a military oath of obedience. When Romans were being enlisted into the armies, there was, I understand, a bowl of blood. And uh, as people committed themselves to serve in the Roman troops, they had to thrust their hand into this bowl of blood. And it was an oath sign of their commitment to the army unto blood, either to death or perhaps even to be executed for defecting, that kind of thing. So it had the notion of a solemn oath, and the other element of it was something which was set apart and sacred. Now, looking at the third star, you'll see that in time, it came to be used in ecclesiastical circles to refer to spiritual mysteries. It was used rather imprecisely in this way at first and included a number of different rites and practices. With time, it became restricted to just seven in the Roman Catholic or two in Reformed practices. So, okay, to begin with, we're just looking at the term sacrament. Don't get phased by it. It's a theological term. You might say, I don't particularly like using it. Not sure that I do necessarily, but we can work with that. We don't need to get too strung up over it. Originally then, a general term relating to mystery. Now, just in this regard, let me just, you don't need to turn to this. But in, uh, in the authorized version of the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, for example, you've got this. Paul wrote, so then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now in the Greek that is mysterion or mysteries. And many of the older church fathers said, look, here's Paul writing to the Corinthians, describing himself as an apostle, as somebody entrusted with the secret things or the mysteries of God. And that was one of the proof texts or reference points that the medieval and scholastic theologians used to describe the sacraments. They associated the sacraments, the mysteries, with what Paul writes here. I think that what Paul is talking about is the mysteries of God relate to the what? When Paul uses that term mystery, he's talking particularly as a rule concerning the what? The, the gospel of Christ which was that hidden mystery spoken about in the prophets beforehand, but only revealed with the coming of Christ. So generally he speaks about mystery in connection with the message of the gospel or of God's redeeming grace in the person of Christ. But medieval scholastic theologians used it particularly of the rites and ceremonies connected with church life, particularly with the mass and the Lord's Supper. So that's where this term came to be used. Sacraments are related to mysteries. Let's pick up and see how A.A. A. Hodge defines that at the bottom of the page. He says this, In its classical usage, the term designated anything which binds or brings under obligations as a sum of money given in pledge or an oath and especially the oath of military allegiance. That was probably its oldest use. In its ecclesiastical, that's its church-related usage, the term sacrament, the word, while retaining its general sense of something binding as sacred, was at an early period used as the Latin equivalent of the Greek word mysterion, that which is unknown until revealed. Hence, any symbol, type, or rite having latent spiritual meaning, that is, having a deeper spiritual sense or meaning, came to be associated with this word sacrament. Hence the word naturally came to be applied to the Christian ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and with them also to many other religious doctrines and ordinances. Well, let's not worry too much about that.
But basically, I just want to, to give you some indication of the word. You won't find it in the scriptures. Used in theology to refer to practices and rites that do have some idea of a solemn oath or binding commitment, uh, but applied especially to things like baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, top of the page two in the notes we've got here anyway, historically there have been widely differing views of the nature of the sacraments and especially on the nature of the relationships or relationship between the sacraments and the word. Now, let's follow this. This is quite important. Three different viewpoints, really. We can speak of them as the Roman Catholic, as the Zwinglian, and as the Reformed. Now, those of you that are going to sit exams, you better make a note beside this because I love to ask exam questions on this kind of thing. What, what are the different perceptions or conceptions of the sacraments uh, expressed in these different schools? Now, firstly, Roman Catholic. In Roman Catholic theology... Roman Catholic theology has argued that the word can only produce historical faith and that the sacraments are necessary for the actual conveying of spiritual grace. In other words, Wilkinson says, the sign became identified with the reality of God's grace so that when someone received the sign, he automatically received the grace. And there's a Latin term, ex operero ab operato, uh, which refers to the automatic conveying of grace in the celebration of the sacrament. Now, what that's saying is this. The Roman Catholic Church taught that in this whole matter of conveying spiritual saving grace, the emphasis is upon the sacraments rather than the word. We would understand from the gospel, certainly Reformed Christians have always understood that the primary emphasis is upon the gospel. Paul didn't go around with a primary emphasis on the ordinances. In fact, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, Christ didn't send me to what? To baptize, but to preach the gospel. In Paul's mind, Paul's perception, the primary concern, the primary agent of God conveying saving grace was the preaching of the gospel. The Holy Spirit used the word to bring about a change of mind and heart. The sacraments were a secondary thing that, as we'll see, underscored and emphasized the word. Now, the Roman Catholic Church reversed that and basically said the word can only produce an historical faith. What do you think they meant by that? Historical faith. Could only produce a rational, objective, intellectual, or theoretical knowledge. You don't have to be a Christian to believe or to understand that according to the Christian faith, there are three persons in the Godhead. Is that right? You don't have to be a Christian. People can understand that. And Roman Catholic theology says the word kind of can give you that objective reality, but it can't convey the spiritual grace. The word can, if you like, put the kindling wood in the grate of the fire, but it can't bring the fire. Only the sacraments can actually convey spiritual grace. And therefore, they gave a very, very high place to the sacraments. It is a sacramental theology. And that's what makes the priests so very, very important in Roman Catholic theology and practice. They are the ones who mediate that grace through observing the sacraments. All right, so that's Roman Catholic theology. Now... As a reaction to that, Zwinglian theologians took the opposite extreme and said that the sacraments were only commemorative symbols and that, in fact, they were no means of grace at all. God didn't use them to actually convey grace. He just used them like illustrations in a picture book or in a book you're reading. Uh, to actually represent pictorially and to commemorate, but there was no way in which the grace of God was actually tied with them to nourish and strengthen or to initiate faith. Appreciate that? So they were essentially commemorative. 
Let's have a look and see what Tom Wilkinson says here. At most, they had a symbolic value in that they pictured or illustrated the message of the word and the gospel. As such, they served as a means of remembering what Christ had done for his people. And this is how many evangelicals often regard the sacraments. The logical extension of this position is to be found in the Salvation Army, which omits them altogether, though it should not be forgotten that the army never intended to be a church, but only a mission. Okay, let's just note that, and it's quite important for what we're, we're looking at tonight to recognize that is a Zwinglian position. It is quite a common one. All the sacraments do is symbolically picture and are commemorative. They are not actually a means that God uses to convey grace to the souls of people. They're just helpful reminders. Get sick of reading words, get sick of hearing sermons. Have a look and see at the sacrament. That will pictorially convey it to you. What does Tom Wilkinson mean, do you think, when he says that the logical extension of this position is to be found in the Salvation Army, which omits them altogether? What does he mean by that? The logical extension of this position. If they are simply commemorative, and the word that he uses is kind of picturing or illustrating the message of the word, if that's all they are, is it possible to leave them out, do you think, without losing anything but particularly? Can you read a copy of Pilgrim's Progress and get the message without having any pictures in it? Can you? Yes, you can. You still can. Okay, it might be more graphic, and if you like reading books with pictures in, you might like to have pictures in the book, but they're not essential to getting the message of the book. And so you can do without the pictures and still get the message. And that's the point Tom Wilkinson is making, that if you assert the sacraments are simply illustrative, well, you can do without the illustrations perfectly well. Thank you. Okay? Now, the third position, which is taken by Kelvin and his Presbyterian successors, is that they were both symbolic and promissory. That is, they contained promises as well. The sacraments were viewed, excuse me, as means used by God to bring his promises and his grace home to the hearts of believers by representing invisible truths in material elements. Now, this is a kind of mediating position. The Roman Catholics basically held the view that grace is connected inseparably with these sacraments. And in fact, you can't get the grace without the sacrament. The Zwinglians said, no, they are illustrations, but they are not used as means of grace, except perhaps accidentally. The Reformed churches have always said, no. They do not inherently convey that grace by themselves, but nor are they empty symbols. But they are visual representations of invisible spiritual truths, which when embraced by faith intelligently, do become a God-appointed means of conveying grace. So, let me jump ahead and perhaps illustrate that with regard to the Lord's Supper. If you were in a Roman Catholic church, and a devout member of the Roman Catholic church, you would come with a holy hush to receive the wafer and perhaps the wine, knowing that this wafer, and if the priest doesn't take all the wine himself anyway, but this wafer anyway is the what? Is the literal, 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 transubstantiated body of Jesus. So you are actually participating in the sacrifice of Christ in a very 
physical way. Woo! That's why, I'm not sure what the current practice is, but that's why historically wine was not given to the laity because of fear that they might what? Spill a drop of the precious blood of Jesus. And why certainly in darker periods of superstition, if a priest was walking along the street, people would genuflect and bow toward him and all the rest because he may be carrying in his pocket a consecrated host, taking it to somebody. He was, in other words, carrying Christ in his pocket. I don't say that irreverently, but that was understanding, carrying Christ in his pocket. Mm -hmm. not, not to bite it because that is the body of Christ okay now in a Zwinglian church come the Lord's Supper there is a kind perhaps of a warm sentimental historical association and commemoration of Jesus having died oftentimes an emphasis on trying to arouse emotions and affections as you think of the suffering that our Lord underwent so Perhaps at best an emotional and sentimental kind of response brought about through an affectionate memory. In a Reformed church where the Lord's Supper is being uh, celebrated intelligently and uh, with conviction, the symbols of the body and the blood of Jesus are not only displayed, but they are again expounded before people. And people are encouraged to view and to recognize this body does represent, the, the, this bread does represent the body of our Lord Jesus. And as you come and eat of this, eat by faith of the Son of God, who is the living bread. Come and be guided through this bread to Christ himself. And as you come, look to him to feed your soul with heavenly grace. And there is the expectation that being led by the visible symbol, we do communicate with the living Christ himself and receive nourishment from him and fresh cleansing and an assurance of forgiveness through him. In a Reformed church, there is the expectation that the celebration of the Lord's Supper will do you good. And you will go away cleaving the more closely to Christ, more in love with Christ, and uh, more committed to him. In Scotland in particular, where the uh, celebration of the Lord's Supper has been associated with extensive uh, preparatory services and even post-communion services, there have been wonderful, wonderful outpourings of the Spirit of God. Christine, I was able to uh, go to a communion service in Apple Cross on one occasion. Alexander Murray was conducting that, that uh, service there. And uh, certainly in the, I was only there for two days, but there's no question you're swept up in an environment of expectation, of focus, and people were drawn very, very particularly and specifically to consider Jesus, the Lamb of God, the bread of life, the light of the world. And as you did come and participate of these symbols of his body and of his blood, there was a thirst and a desire and an eagerness for him that was so wonderfully uh, enriched and strengthened your faith. You went away from those seasons freshly committed to Christ, deeply assured of the fact that he was the, uh, the bread and the blood that we so desperately need for our souls. So, in Reformed Presbyterian churches, the sacraments have been viewed not certainly as conveying grace automatically, but nor just simply as a commemorative symbol, but as a representative commemorative ordinance that God is appointed and is pleased to make a channel of grace and blessing to his people. Okay? Any questions or comments on that? Let's have a look on uh, what, what uh, <coughs> again, Tom Wilkinson says under that statement of Presbyterian or Calvin. He says, for example, 
Baptism not only symbolizes forgiveness or the washing away of sins, but in that sacrament, God truly promises that blessing to those who believe. So there is that awareness in the sacrament of baptism. It is more than simply illustrating something. It contains also a promissory element. God is demonstrating his covenantal faithfulness and commitment to wash, to cleanse, and to renew those who believe. Or to use the language of this paragraph, the sacraments not only represent Christ and all his benefits, but they also confirm our interest in him. That is to say, what Christ promised in his word is confirmed by the sacraments. We've got here, both word and sacraments in Reformed theology anyway were viewed as embracing the same realities or promises. That's a critical thing. The sacraments don't convey any notion that's not already in the word. It's the same thing. It's just a visual representation of them over against a verbal one. It was proper, furthermore, to view the word as primary and the sacraments as secondary. One could have the word without the sacraments, but not the sacraments without the word. Now, it's worth noting that statement because... It does reflect on something we'll say a little bit later or we'll come across a little bit later in terms of the administration of the sacraments. Reformed theology has always said, hey, sacraments are not some magical ordinance that has value in itself. The sacraments would be just superstitious rituals if there wasn't the word prior to them conveying the content of the gospel. The sacraments illumine or confirm or visually represent the, sac the, the gospel promises, but they don't add anything extra to it. So the most critical thing is to have the word and the sacraments follow. You take away the word and you've got a recipe for superstitious ceremonialism. And that's what's so often happened. Got that idea? So... In Reformed theology and Reformed thinking, the word is viewed as primary. Okay, well, I hope that's not overdoing it. It's just a general introduction to the concept of sacraments. We've looked at the term here, and we've also looked a little bit in terms of the different approaches or views to the sacraments. Any last comments or questions about that? Well, do remember that. Uh, it's quite important to see those broad classes. There's always dangers of overgeneralizing when you're trying to do something like that. But historically, those are the three broad positions. Well, we move on. You see there's a dash about two-thirds of the way or just a little over halfway down the page which says this. In Reformed theology, sacraments are defined more specifically as ordinances that serve as signs and seals of the covenant of grace. Now, this is really a very, very important thing to understand because this is a point of departure between certainly covenantal theologians and, shall we say, those of a more distinctively Baptistic view. Now, I'm not wanting to be polemic or anything like that at all. So, Bill, I'm not thinking of you, my dear brother, when I talk about this, or anybody else that might be a Baptistic. Darby, over here. Darby, I'm too, too afraid to wrestle him anyway. He's much fitter and stronger than me, and he would beat me up every time. But this is for the point and purpose of clarity and definiteness. As I perceive and understand it anyway, a very common and popular Baptistic understanding of the sacraments is to view them simply historically from a new covenantal point of view. So we look particularly at something like baptism and we say, well, this is a conversion ordinance that Jesus instituted. And people come to the New Testament and they see here's Jesus giving his disciples a commission to go make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we see in the book of Acts, people being baptized. And Baptist theologians and people of Baptistic commitment say, well, here we have baptism 
is instituted by Christ simply as a conversion ordinance, which effectively has the value of testifying of the work of salvation that's gone on in the heart. There is a strong testimonial element to it, even a predominantly testimonial element to it. It is a subjective testimony to what's happened or the decision that we've made and the commitment we make. So I don't think it is wrong to say that there's a predominant idea in Baptistic theology that the sacrament of baptism especially is uh, a conversion ordinance in which there is a testimony to what's happened in the heart. Now, Reformed theologians, or shall I say this, covenantal theologians, have an understanding of the sacraments which, as you probably expect, begin right back in the Old Testament and sweep their way forward. They say that Sac sacramental theology, or the whole theology of signs, if you like, has its roots and origins a way, way back in the beginning of God's dealings with his people. We find very, very early in the history of redemption, in fact, in the history of creation, that God has not only spoken words, but he has given visual and visible symbols <laughs> of his word, promise or gospel. wonder if any of you can think of the very earliest visual representation of a word or an idea that we do have in the scriptures. Well, the rainbow is a very early one, but there's one even earlier than that. Okay, he must have killed an animal to provide skins for Adam and Eve, potentially so, but that was not so much a permanent thing, that was a once-off typical action. But even, even before that, what did God plant in the garden? Lots of trees, but in the midst of the trees of the garden, he denominated what? Two trees, particularly. One tree was called the tree of life, and the other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you think that those trees had big names written on them as to what they were? Do you think in all probability they were ordinary trees, or at least they were trees? Trees like other trees, created trees? I think they were. But they were trees nevertheless marked out by the word of God as having particular significance. Adam and Eve would have known precisely what those trees were and which ones they were. No mistaking about that at all. But I don't think that those trees had in them some inherent sap quality that conveyed life, but rather by God's word were nevertheless to be made effective in producing consequences or results. So his word attached to a particular tree invested that tree with a particular significance. And that is the essence of a sign that God has given. Just as the bread that we use in the Lord's Supper, for example, doesn't have in it any mystical or magical quality, we, we believe, right? But nevertheless, when that is set apart to represent the body of the Lord Jesus Christ by the words of institution, not that they have got magical value in themselves, but when we, in obedience to the Lord, set bread apart to represent his body, his word of institution gives that bread a special significance. Okay. God seems to have dealt from the beginning of time with man in that way. Calvin speaks of God accommodating to our weakness, our fragility, our sensuousness, if you like, our need to have something visible or physical as well as conceiving it in our minds. 
Do the religions of the world suggest that man does have a hunger for something visible in religion? Sure does. We'll build a statue, we'll make an image, an idol, we'll create icons or something or other because man hankers for the visible. God knows that. He knows he has made us as people that observe, see, and uh, are most deeply affected oftentimes for what we see. So from the beginning, there has been a word and there's been a sign. Now, that was there in the Garden of Eden in the beginning. And we certainly find that also when God renews his covenant with Noah. I will establish my covenant with you, he says to Noah. And in the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis, we read that having saved Noah by the ark from the flood, he says this, <clears throat> he not only establishes a covenant with him, but in the 12th verse of Genesis 9, God says, this is the sign or authorized version. This is the token. This is the token of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. God gave Noah a promise, but he also gave him a visible sign, which was the rainbow. There again, you've got this whole concept of sign theology in the scriptures. That's further extended, of course, when you get to Abraham. And God promises Abraham a numerous offspring. He promises that through him he will bless all the nations. Abraham, of course, doesn't have any legitimate, or at least doesn't have a child of promise at this stage. And after having given those promises, then God says that he will establish his covenant with him and uh, goes on to say this. Uh, As for you, you must keep the covenant. You and descendants, verse 10 of chapter 17. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep, every male among you shall be circumcised. God gives us a sign of the promise. And what is more, there is in that sign at least something that connects it with the content of the promise. God's promising Abraham a numerous seed, a numerous seed that he will take to be his own, whom he will bless. Ultimately, in that regard, it means those whom he will save, whom he will purify. And in the circumcision of the foreskin, there was a bloody act of the removal of flesh signifying God's purpose to purify a people through the offspring of Abraham. That kind of thing was all entailed in that sort of thing. So you've got promise, gospel promise, and gospel sign. You carry on, of course, to the Mosaic administration. And you've got the Mosaic Covenant, and connected with the Mosaic Covenant, do you think you've got a sign, a series of sign ordinances relating to that? Of course we do, in the sacrificial worship, all pointing more significantly even to God's redemptive saving purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, what I think we need to appreciate is, that when Jesus comes and institutes baptism, he doesn't do that in a vacuum. I think that's the most critical thing for us to understand. He suddenly doesn't just institute a visible sign without there being any forerunners of this promise and sign. Quite the contrary. The gospel has been preached. There have been promises given. The covenant of God has been administered to people. And with that, there have been these visible Symbols given that on the one hand represent and illustrate it, and from that point of view we call them signs, but they do more than that. They also assure and confirm and stand out as God's confirmatory promise. They are signs and seals of the gospel promises. Now that's basically how the reformers and Excuse me. 
And certainly how the framers of the Westminster Confession of Faith come up with this kind of thing. There is a larger context, they say, to the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism. They are not just isolated events. They belong to this larger structure of covenant theology. Remember, as we've studied the Confession of Faith, we've seen that the idea of covenant at root has the notion of relationship. I will be your God. You will be my people. A covenantal bond where God separates a people for himself. In covenant theology, Christ is appointed as the mediator of that covenant. The covenant head, the one who ratifies, who confirms the covenant, the one through whom all its blessings of salvation, life, and forgiveness are conveyed to people. So God's saving grace, God's saving covenant, all has to do with Christ and centers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament, as the promise of salvation and the promise of grace, or if you put it another way, as God brought people into relationship with himself, into covenant fellowship and into covenant bond with himself, he gave those people outward signs and seals of that relationship and of that grace. And what the framers of the confession say, when you come through to the new covenant administration of that larger covenant of grace in Christ, there is a change in the nature of the signs. They are no longer anticipatory. They are no longer bloody signs pointing forward to the blood of Jesus, but they become non-bloody signs that reflect the newness of the new covenant administration of that covenant in Christ. But essentially, they say, this is what baptism and the Lord's Supper are. They are divine, visible symbols that Christ or God himself appends to the promise of the gospel to demonstrate it, to illustrate it, and to confirm it, and to assure it. So that... When a person is baptized, the primary emphasis is not upon that person, for example, making a testimony to the world of their decision, but the primary emphasis is upon God testifying that he will cleanse, he will wash, he will save those who through faith in Christ become members of the covenant family and the covenant community. Okay, Reformed theology has had an object, primarily objective rather than subjective view of the sacraments. They are God saying, these are signs and seals of my gospel promise. Receive them, embrace them, and enjoy them as tokens of my commitment to you. Got the idea? That, that's how it's viewed here. Holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace instituted directly by God. Comments, questions, do you appreciate that? What are we talking about there? I hope I've made that clear enough. Catherine, is that clear enough? All right. Here we are. Let's come back to our notes then on page two. In Reformed theology, sacraments are defined more specifically as ordinances that serve as signs and seals of the covenant of grace. God has bound himself in covenant to his people and given them promises of salvation through Christ. Characteristically, and in the Old Testament in particular, God has given his people holy signs and seals of that covenant relationship and its promises. So, as uh, I think Tom Wilkinson says, the sacrament should not be seen in isolation as two independent entities. Their proper function must be seen only in relation to what's called the covenant of grace. The sacraments are spoken of as signs because they are essentially symbols that point to realities beyond themselves. That's what a sign does. A sign points to deeper spiritual reality beyond itself. Okay, you can look at that yourself. Uh, 
and down below the sacraments also spoken as seals of the covenant because they confirm its promises. A seal is something which authenticates or confirms that to which it is affixed or appended. The seal is of benefit to the recipient, not the giver. Every time I see baptism being administered, my heart is again and again deeply renewed and comforted and assured because as I see that water applied to or perhaps people plunged into water, what that speaks to my own heart is just as surely as that person is cleansed by the water, so surely does God promise that all my sins are washed away. It is a sign and it is a confirmatory seal. And that's why, again, these older divines and the Puritans would say, improve your baptism by the intelligent observation and spiritual entering into the recelebration of a baptism. Only baptized once because you're only regenerated once. You're only renewed once, which is what it signifies. You're only included in Christ once. So properly you're only baptized once. But we can nevertheless observe baptism again and again and again, and by faith still be nourished, strengthened, and confirmed in our faith. You imagine, for example, that you've just done something absolutely crazy at work. You've been tempted and pestered by other non-Christian workers at work, uh, let's say, um, to use the uh, tea money pot as a little bank reservoir for going out for a party or something. You say, oh, look, I haven't bought any money. Oh, just, just use, just use the, the teapot. Take $20 out and go and get your McDonald's and so on. And you've been doing that kind of thing and you haven't uh, paid the $20 back. And whew, the Lord's begun to put his finger on your heart and you feel just vile, dirty, etc. But it's amounted to $100 and you haven't got a $100 spare. And you feel wretched. And uh, you come along to worship service again. You're still going to church. And you just feel about the lousiest person under the sun. You're just sweltering. And then you see baptism being administered. Or the Lord's Supper being celebrated. And once again, God brings home to your heart and mind and soul that just as defilement is washed, so your sins also can be and are made clean through faith in Christ. It improves your baptism and uh, makes it a fresh to you. So that, that's the sort of thing that uh, was done in the past. Let's just finish this last little bit off point two and then we'll take a break. Sorry for going over. They are immediately instituted by God himself. Only these ordinances instituted by God or Christ specifically to represent the promised blessings of the covenant of grace are considered in Reformed theology to be sacraments. It is only divine institution that gives them the force of being sacraments. There's nothing unique about the physical elements themselves. They have special significance and are instrumental means of grace only because God has appointed them for that purpose. Now, again, let me just illustrate this. I, I think, frankly, I quite quite enjoy sacramental theology because <laughs> it's got lots of interesting depths to it. You just think about this. Is it possible to, to look at almost any truth in the Christian faith and think, oh, I will have a visible symbol for this? You might, for example, take the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints and uh, you decide, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go and pick a daisy every day and put it in a glass of water. So in your household, the Wetton household, for example, on the windowsill, there's a little glass with water in it, and it's always got a dandelion in it, or something like that. Always got a dandelion, or a daisy, or some little flower. And uh, 
after the tenth time in the wet and house, you say, what in the world's that dandelion and the glass up there for, Christine? And she says, oh, that's one of my sacraments. So, oh, very interesting. What do you mean? Well, she said, we always have a fresh dandelion or daisy in that to symbolize perseverance. You know, you just keep going. You never wilt. You never die. But you always keep... Now, is it possible to do that? I mean, we could do that, could we not? We, we could. We could do all sorts of things like that to have little visual reminders of particular truths. Now, your question is asked. Okay, if you hold to a strictly Zwinglian view of the sacraments, namely those sacraments are nothing more than illustrations anyway, well, so what? You perhaps could do that. And uh, maybe you don't lose anything anyway. If, however, we have a Calvinistic view of the sacraments, which means, which, which is this, they are ordinances which God appoints intentionally and makes means of grace and uses to represent as signs and confirmatory seals of his promises. Do you think we can go and invent things to do that? Of course we can't. God alone can appoint an ordinance and invest it with the character of being a channel of living grace for his people. And that's why in this definition that we have here, sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace instituted directly by God. It's not up to us to invent things. God alone can appoint those ordinances which he means to mark out essential dimensions of the covenant of grace and that we can embrace and receive as from him and as means of grace. Okay, we'll leave it there. Sorry I've gone on so long. But uh, that, broadly speaking anyway, is what the sacraments are in Reformed theology. Let's take a break and come back. Sam, you've got a funny look on your face there. Perhaps you'll chew over that and come back and uh, let me know if there is something bugging you. All right, where we go. Let's kick into things again. Um, Sam has uh, expressed his, his uh, frown to me. So No, I know, but... We'll talk more about that in systematic theology next year. Oh, that'll be great. We have some good times then. <laughs> Let's uh, pick up, can we? And oh, he, he's right. He's not that confused. There's a little section. Sam, Sam was just wondering about this whole idea of talking about baptism washing away sins. And... Um, We'll mention in one of our later sections the sacramental notion and language that's used, but we'll come to that in a few minutes. Now we're going to crack, whip, and go. The nature. Now we look at purpose. What's the purpose of sacraments? Why give them? The confession of faith represents these four different purposes here. Firstly, to represent Christ and his benefits. That's the position the reformers took in the Old Testament sign symbols as well after the fall, all representing Christ, the burnt offering, the, all the offerings in the sacrificial system, all pointing in some way or another to Christ, representing Christ and the benefits that are connected with him, the mediator of that covenant of grace. The second is, the purpose of them is to confirm the right we have to him. When we look at baptism next week, Lord willing, sorry, Lord's Supper in a couple of weeks' time, one of the, um, the things that I hope to be able to bring out and remember to bring out on that occasion is that in specifying that we are to take and to eat, 
of that bread and then to drink of that wine. The Lord Jesus is affirming our right to participate in him and to share in that. If he simply said, demonstrate, show this bread and show this wine to people, you could be left with the impression that, well, it's lovely, it's out there though. It's out there, but not in here. Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. In that, the Lord, even in the sacramental words and actions, is conveying the right we have to the blessings in him. It expresses the intimacy of our union with Christ as nothing else really can. As much as Louise loves her new husband, she doesn't eat him. <laughs> At least I hope not. <laughs> to actually symbolize their union together as husband and wife. But the Lord Jesus has given us a sign which in an incredible way reflects the wonderful union we have with him and our right to possess him. Another is this, it does put a visible difference between those who belong to the church and the rest of the world. The sacraments do, and I personally think it in an indirect and secondary way, mark out and testify to the world the distinctness of the people. In the Old Testament, you recall that the alien wasn't allowed to take part on the Passover unless he was circumcised. Uh, and that kind of thing marked Israel out and the Israelite out from their neighbors. Similarly today, baptism marks out the people of God from those outside the church. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a communion or covenantal fellowship meal that belongs to the covenant community and not to those outside. So it is a way of marking out those who belong to God and who are participants in the covenant. And here it is another. Solemnly to pledge them to service. There is a reverse side to the ordinances. On the one hand, God represents the blessings of salvation to us and in giving them to us, confirms and assures us of our right and entitlement to participate in those blessings. But having received those blessings, we now are under what? Under obligation to fulfill the demands of the covenant. Have we been baptized and testified and received even on our own bodies the water that signifies union with Christ and washing and cleansing, then that baptism testifies against us if need be, but it testifies that we are part of the covenant community of God's people, the body of Christ, and we are to live as members of that. So our baptism should again and again remind us that we have died to the old, we have risen in Christ to the new, we have put off the old, put on the new, and is an obligation to do that. Similarly, our feeding on Christ in the Lord's Supper emphasizes again our obligation to live and move and have our being in Him day by day. So, here we are. They solemnly pledge us to service, to covenant fidelity, to covenant commitment in the world. For God in Christ according to his word. All right, those are four things then of the value. They represent Christ, confirm the right, put a visible difference between ourselves and the world, and pledge and commit us afresh to service. Again, older theologians and older churchmen used to speak of the Lord's Supper, for example, as a covenant renewal act. Every time we'd participate in the Lord's Supper, we are reaffirming our commitment to be the people of Christ and to live out of him and in him. Right, well, so much for the nature and the purposes. Can I just ask, are there things we're looking at here, perhaps things you've not thought about greatly before? Is this all old hat to you or some of this perhaps heresy you've never heard of before. <laughs> As a rule, I think today people don't think deeply 
about the theological and biblical foundations for the sacraments uh, tend to just think more generally. But let's look on. The sign and the spiritual reality or sacramental union is the title I've given the overhead up the top here. And here we read this. There is in each sacrament a spiritual relation or sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified from which it results in the names and effects of the things signified being attributed to the sign. Well, you see, that's a bit of gobbledygook. Let me give you an illustration of the history behind this to uh, understand why this is in the Confession of Faith. Some of you may remember or have read in your church history studies, there was a disputation between Luther, Calvin, Philip Melanchthon and a number of other reformers over the Lord's Supper to try and bring unity between the Lutheran section of the Reformed Church and the Reformed Swiss uh, uh, Reformed section of it. And uh, Luther and Calvin debated long on this. And eventually, so I seem to recall it was either with his knife or a piece of chalk, Luther ended up just in frustration writing these words, This is my body on the wooden table. And he says, Here I stand again, effectively. He's not going to move. Jesus said, This is my body. And he was using that as an argument for consubstantiation. The Roman Catholics, as we'll see when we look at the Lord's Supper, Roman Catholic position that the bread and the wine are converted into the literal body and blood of Jesus called transubstantiation. The Lutheran view is called consubstantiation, which is not a literal transformation of the physical substance, but a coexistence in the physical substance of the spiritual reality. I've got myself into trouble here, haven't I, giving this illustration. <laughs> if I can just, consubstantiation is not an easy concept to understand. Transubstantiation is much easier. Mystically, magically, that bit of bread gets conveyed into the body of Jesus. So even though it looks like a wafer or a bit of bread still, it is the body of Jesus. Lutherans say, no, that bit of wafer or that bit of bread is still bread, still wafer, but mysteriously and mystically and spiritually, nevertheless, the body of Christ is attached with that and in that or under that uh, spiritually. So the two things are together. It's a little bit like you've got a poker, you put the poker in the fire, the poker is still steel, but as a result of the fire, it is infused with heat. The bread is still bread, but it's infused, as it were, with the body of Christ. That's what Lutherism says. So it's a halfway house between Reformed. Now, at that dispute, Luther said effectively, here I stand. The scripture says, Jesus said to his disciples, this is my body. So you can't get around it. That bit of bread is not just bread. It is the body of Christ. Got the idea? Now, this is where this particular statement comes in. And that's why it's in the Confession of Faith. It's trying to give an explanation to this. It says this. Let's have a look at our notes. Perhaps I've put it here. And if I stick to these, we might get through it quickly. And I mightn't get too far off beat. This section teaches that there is a spiritual relationship between the sign and the thing signified in the sacraments. Sacraments involve material or physical signs. Is that correct? Bread, wine, water. There are material, physical signs there. There are physical elements involved, and those elements depict more or less closely a spiritual reality. We'll talk about that when we look at the individual sacraments. But you've got a physical sign representing a spiritual reality. Now, point two is this. In every sacrament, there is a spiritual or a sacramental relationship between the sign and the thing signified. What does that mean? 
There is a definite relation between the sign and the thing signified. This is firstly symbolical or representative. The one symbolizes and so represents the other. Zwinglian sacramental theology goes no further than that. It says the bread symbolizes or represents, but there is a relationship. The bread symbolizes a spiritual reality. Okay, now Calvinistic theology says there is also an instrumental relationship between the sign and the thing signified because by divine appointment, through the right use of the sign, the grace signified is really conveyed. Now that's going to put Hamish's here up on the end as well. Most of us do in connection with infant baptism or in connection with baptism. Does baptism actually convey the grace? Well, that's something which theologians argued. And we would say, no, it doesn't. Baptism doesn't convey that grace automatically. But nevertheless, it's not an empty sign. But we can't go into that fully now. We'll deal with that more when we come to baptism itself. However, in this whole area, you've got a sign. Let's tell you a bit of bread. You've got a sign, you've got a thing signified, the body of Christ and all the benefits between it. Now, it's symbolically representing, but what the Reformed theologians want to say is also there's an instrumental relationship between the two because God is so pleased to connect the administration of his grace with the faith filled participation in the sacrament that it can become an instrument of his grace and blessing when it is properly used. Get that idea? When we in faith embrace that bit of bread is representing the body of Christ to become instrumentally connected. So the sacramental union is not only symbolical but instrumental. Now, this relation is essentially spiritual or sacramental it rests on the fitness of the sign to represent the grace signified. It also depends on the authoritative appointment of Christ that these signs properly used shall truly represent and convey the grace that signified over the page. Finally, it depends on the spiritual faith of the believing recipient whereby he is able to discern the intended spiritual reality and appropriate the grace offered. Now, this is something that is not easy to see. It's just basically saying, hey, those symbols are not just empty signs. They're not just pictures there that are commemorative because God has appointed them and God doesn't just flaunt and toy with us. He is pleased to associate his grace with them as they are believingly and properly embraced and received. They become means of grace. So there is a spiritual connection between the sign and the spiritual reality. They can become means of conveying that grace to people. You understand that, Delwyn? What am I talking about? Now, because of that, we've got here point B, correspondingly, the names and effects of the one are attributed to the other. The sign and the spiritual reality. Now, I was just talking with, who was it? With Sam in the break about this kind of thing. In Acts chapter 22, since I've got that before us, Paul is reciting his conversion before the Jews when he's arrested in Jerusalem. And he talks about how on the road to Damascus, he saw this great light. He got to Damascus, he was blinded. And then God spoke to Ananias and told him to go to the house where Paul was staying and speak to him. And verse 14 of chapter 22, we read this. Ananias says, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Now, on the surface, it seems as though Ananias is saying, Saul, you be baptized, and baptism will wash your sins away. That 
That seems like, doesn't it? Now, the theologians say, because not even ba you know, Baptist theologians wouldn't, wouldn't say as a vast rule anyway that baptism actually washes sins away. So they say, well, what in the world does Ananias mean? And they say, well, because there is this link in union, baptism is not just an empty sign, nor does it automatically convey grace, but nevertheless it does represent a spiritual blessing that when it is embraced in faith becomes a spiritual reality. Sometimes the sign is spoken of as the thing that it's pointing to. Wash away your sins. In the same sort of way, Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. When you eat the bread, you're eating the body of Christ. Sometimes you'll hear it officiating ministers and the Lord's Supper say, this is the body of Christ. Eat the body of Christ. Have you never heard that? You've heard mm -hmm. you, you, you have. Now, that is strong language of faith employing this sacramental union thing where the sign and the reality that's being spoken about are joined together almost. So we've got this kind of thing from which it results in the names and effects of the thing signified being attributed to the sign. Eat the body of Christ. Well, it's not the physical body of Christ, but it signifies the body of Christ. And because it's not just an empty sign, but does convey by the grace of God to us the spiritual reality that comes from the body of Christ, you can say, eat the body of Christ. So that's what, Luther, what, that's what Calvin said to Luther. You take your knife out of the table, he said. <laughs> this is what it means. It is not literally the body of Christ. That is a way of speaking where the spiritual reality is attributed simply to the physical sign <clears throat> because the two things are very closely and intimately connected spiritually. All right? Don't get too hang up on that. Simply a way of explaining the very, very close relationship between those two things in the scriptures. Here I am. Cut myself short again on time to look at maybe more important things. This is a really important area of sacramental theology also, the efficacy of the sacraments. What is that big word, John? Efficacy, efficacy. Do you know what that means? Put it in other words for us, the efficacy of the sacraments. Anybody else just say pass? The effectiveness, that's right. The enjoyment of the blessing connected with the sacraments. The effectiveness of it. Here we've got, let's read this. The grace which is exhibited in or by the sacraments, rightly used, is not conferred by any power in them, nor does the efficacy of a sacrament depend on the piety or intention of the one who administers it, but upon the work of the Holy Spirit and the declaration instituting the sacraments, which declaration contains, together with a precept authorizing the use of the sacraments, a promise of benefit to worthy receivers of the sacraments. Well, whew, here we are again. I haven't got so much time to look through this, so let's have a look at it. The grace which is exhibited in the sacraments rightly used. Let's think of the Lord's Supper. What kind of what, 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 what sort of spiritual blessings or graces are pictured and portrayed in the Lord's Supper? Shed, when you, when, when you participate in the Lord's Supper, what kind, just give me one spiritual grace or blessing that's portrayed and pictured in the Lord's Supper. Okay, washing away of sins or spiritual nourishment or feeding in Christ as well. Okay, those things there. Now, that is the grace which is exhibited or revealed or portrayed in the sign. Okay, that's the grace. How is it conferred? How does it come to be part of our experience? Now, 
What the framers of the confession say negatively first, because remember they are writing this against the backdrop of Roman Catholicism. They say, it is not conferred by any power in them. The sacraments don't have any innate power in themselves. You touch that wafer and you're instantly sanctified. Or you receive that drop of holy anointed water and you're instantly cleansed of all your sins. It's not any power inherently in the sacraments themselves that, that convey the grace. Nor does the efficacy of a sacrament depend upon the piety or the intention of the one who administers it. Now, here again, there are two extremes the confession is guarding against. It doesn't depend on the piety, the more puritanical, separatist streams of the church would say, oh ho, you're not receiving blessing from the Lord's Supper. You know why? What the problem is? Is that minister up the front there? He was out playing golf the other day when he should have been praying. How in the world can you get a spiritual blessing through the Lord's Supper when you've got such a carnal man as that? <laughs> right, or fishing. <laughs> All right. He was out fishing instead of playing, instead of praying. He was praying while he was fishing. Oh, he's praying. <laughs> he was praying while he was fishing. Okay, fair enough. Okay, some people would say that the grace of God is tied to the holiness of the minister administering it. Ooh, you imagine that? Bit scary, isn't it? Nor, on the other hand, to the intention of the one who administers it. Now, this little bit's worthwhile just noting. This, again, relates especially to the, to the Roman Catholic position. Top of page 5 in the notes given today, there's a citation there from Hodge and another from Roland Ward. Let's have a look and see what A.A. A. Hodge says. He says, essentially under Roman Catholic theology... The efficacy of the sacrament really depends upon the fact that the administrator exercises at the moment of administration the secret intention of doing thereby what the church intends in the definition of the sacrament. The priest may outwardly pronounce every word and perform every action prescribed in the ritual and the recipient may fulfill every condition required of him or her and yet if the priest fails in the secret intention of conferring the grace through the sacrament, then and there the recipient goes away destitute of the grace he supposes himself to have received and which the priest has ostensibly professed to confer. Now, the doctrine of intention in regard to the sacraments, and we'll see in a few moments that in Roman Catholic theology... The sacraments were viewed in covering every major exigency from birth to the grave, from baptism to extreme unction at the very point of death. They had something for every phase of life. Now, one of those sacraments, of course, is the sacrament of holy matrimony, marriage. Sorry, Shed and Louise. But John, when he pronounced you husband and wife, didn't really intend for you to be husband and wife, okay? And so you have not received the sacramental grace. And uh, even though the Roman Catholic Church doesn't believe in divorce, aha, uh -huh, there's a loophole, a way out, perhaps. If you want to get divorced, the priest could say, I didn't intend you to be married when I pronounce those words, and that will... Now, that's rather extreme, but that kind of thing has been used and appealed to in the case of important personages, the doctrine of intention. I didn't really intend it to be so. Hey, wasn't that pretty, pretty uh, critical? You know, if you're on your deathbed and uh, you're on a call for the priest, you know, the priest's got to be there to administer the last rites to you, which kind of... Uh, secure you a particular route anyway through purgatory to the heavenly gates. And if you knew the priest was going to... Be, doesn't that give him an enormous power? 
Doesn't that mean that during your lifetime you're going to be very careful how you speak to them and how you pay your dues and your tithes and all the rest? Enormous, enormous leverage in certain societies at points in time that uh, sacramental theology has resulted in. So that is guarding against those two extremes. Excessive Puritanism, if you like, which says only the holiness of the instrument is really going to determine the value of that, rather than seeing the ordinance more objective given by God. It is God's word, God's seal, God's affirmation to you. And on the other hand, the intention of the priest who administers it. So it doesn't depend upon those things, any inherent power in it, a mystical, magical thing you expect to be zapped every time you eat or have a drop of water on you or whatever. Uh, nor depend on the uh, agent, uh, but upon the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's the critical thing. It is the Spirit of Christ himself using these ordinances in some way or another to convey and communicate grace, especially the Lord's Supper to us. Um, so he is the one, the Holy Spirit. And the other point is here, and the declaration instituting the sacraments. Now, they are of value in the grace being conveyed to us because that grace is conveyed to us intelligently. Okay? It comes to us rationally as our faith and our minds and hearts are open to understand more and more. And it is the promise of the ordinance, of, of the words of institution, the pro and declaration. They declare the content and meaning of the sacrament and ordinance and also convey the promise themselves. So it's those things in which the efficacy does reside. Okay, the work of the Spirit, the declaration instituting the sacraments, which declaration contains together with a precept authorizing the use of the sacraments, a promise of benefit to worthy receivers of the sacraments. So embracing those things, we can look forward to receiving grace, mercy, and blessing. So that's how does the grace exhibited in the sacraments actually become an experienced reality? And as we'll see, particularly more so when we look at the Lord's Supper, it is faith exercised in the promise made effective in us by the Holy Spirit, resulting in nourishment and upbuilding. Okay, happy enough with that? that that's what it's guarding there. Guarding against this uh, automatic conveying of grace in the ordinances themselves. And that leads us to the very last of the sections we look at, namely the number, administration, and continuity of the sacraments. Let's have a look quickly at the number. There are only two sacraments appointed by Christ our Lord in the gospel, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism an initiation ordinance, one that's connected with submission to discipleship, belief in him, the Lord's Supper, a repeated, nourishing, hope-orientated ordinance. Uh, these are the only two, according to the, the Reformed faith anyway, neither of which may be administered by anyone other than a minister of the words been lawfully ordained. We'll touch on that in a moment. But look at the number first. Back to our notes. There are only two over against the seven recognized in Roman Catholicism of uh, that particular day. In some instances, there have been as many as 30 sacraments recognized. The Council of Trent in the 16th century, the Roman Catholic Church gave formal sanction to just seven, though some Catholic scholars, Roman Catholic scholars, have reservations about some of them. The seven sacraments were baptism, confirmation, the Lord's Supper, penance, extreme unction, orders, and marriage. Orders relating to entry into the priesthood to be a nun or a brother in some monastic order, that kind of thing. Okay, point made here. She, the Church of Rome, makes much of the symbolism of seven Okay, in the scripture, seven is an important symbolic number, so the church makes uh, a big deal about there being seven. Uh, 
and links each sacrament to the stages of life, reflecting the thought that the totality of man's life from birth to death is flooded with sacramental supernatural light. Roman Catholic theology fixes the number of sacraments on the basis of its view that they constitute a series of supernatural acts that infuse supernatural grace into all of life from beginning to end rather than upon an indutable foundation of biblical exegesis. So why do they have seven? Well, they basically say we need grace for the whole of life. And these seven give us something at every particular phase. Okay, you've got baptism at the beginning. You've got extreme unction at the end. Confirmation, Lord's Supper, penance, orders, and marriage. Okay, over against that, the Reformers accepted only two sacraments, the baptism and the Lord's Supper, as we've noted there. Now, B, you happy enough about that? That's, that's the number. Administration. The Reformers were very strong on the point that neither of which may be administered by anyone other than a minister of the word who's been lawfully ordained. Now, two reasons for this. A minister of the word, their commitment to that was that the sacraments only have significance, meaning, value, and content in connection with the word of the gospel. They are not isolated ceremonies that in themselves have value. They are seals and signs of gospel promises in the word. And the efficacy, the effectiveness of the sacraments depends very, very much upon the gospel realities being proclaimed in the gospel, in the word. So reformers have said word and sacrament must always be closely held together and the proper administration of the sacraments is always connected with the administration of the word. And that's the reason they've insisted that a minister of the word, now the other point, lawfully ordained, the argument here is that the sacraments do not belong to Christians individually so much as to the church. We don't baptize in our baths at home, our little children when they're born or whatever. And we don't sit down at a meal and say as independent families, uh, let's tonight celebrate the Lord's Supper. We have some wine here and some unleavened bread. Let's just have the Lord's Supper together. We, we don't say that anyway. Uh, it's a question of how did the early church operate in that regard. And I'll touch on that in a second or two. There's a general recognition that the ordinances do not belong just to the individual Christian, but they belong to the corporate community, the covenant community, and are not private possessions. So they're not privately administered, but they are administered by those who are recognized as the lawful administrators of the mercies of God in the covenant community, in the church. Okay, got that? That's the logic behind this. Now, I think that having said that, and I hope I'm not betraying infidelity to this, I certainly agree with the principles behind those two things. I do think that in the early church, however, there was a great deal more spontaneity about the administration of the Lord's Supper than we probably have today, such that when maybe two, three, four, five, six, seven families may be met together for the purposes of Christian fellowship in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just, hey, Shed and Louise, come and have a meal with us tonight. And as we do that, hey, what about having the Lord's Supper together? You think it's a good idea? That's to desecrate the ordinance. But if we meet together in the name of Jesus, to fulfill the purposes of fellowship, upbuilding, mutual instruction, prayer, etc. I think the early Christians also broke bread together. And they commemorated the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus in what we might regard as less formal gatherings of the saints. And personally, I don't have a problem with that myself where people are meeting together in the name of Jesus Christ for those spiritual and religious purposes. Okay? And similarly, I, I'm not 
while I agree with the underlying principles there, I'm not just trying to have my cake and eat it as well, because I do believe the word is critical to invest significance and to make that a means of grace and to avoid it becoming a superstitious rite. Now, I do believe it does need to be administered representatively rather than individually. Those principles are there. But I'm hesitant to say that only an ordained minister can legitimately administer the Lord's Supper to the Lord's people. Uh, and that is quite widely acknowledged within Reformed or Presbyterian, certainly Presbyterian churches, where others than ordained ministers, particularly elders, are in many instances able to administer the Lord's Supper and do administer the Lord's Supper. But anyway, that explains the rationale behind that and the principle that lies behind that, okay? It's not an empty superstitious rite, and it is to be administered representatively. The last point is essential unity. The sacraments of the Old Testament in regard to the spiritual things signified and exhibited by them were, as regards substance, the same as those of the new. The Confession of Faith recognizes, as I indicated before, there were Old Testament sacraments, signs and seals of God's covenant grace. And what this says is, that in terms of spiritual substance, pointing to the death of Christ, pointing to the cleansing, the forgiveness, pointing to the hope of eternal glory, those things were the same as the new and substance, but the outward administration and form of them changed in connection with the new covenant administration of God's grace. That's all we've got time for. Tonight, you'll see I've got an extra note or two on that and ways in which they're the same and different. We'll pick those up and look at them more fully when we look at baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, Davi, I have these books for you here that you, we talked about today, so don't forget those before we go. We're running out of time, particularly for our uh, radio listeners or telephone listeners, so we have to draw fairly closely to that. But by all means, come and talk if you want to talk more about this. But we will have... Hopefully, opportunity to continue to mull over these ideas when we look over the next two weeks at baptism and the Lord's Supper. I hope you have found that of some interest, maybe not totally satisfying. There are some things that uh, are very hard to get a grip on, and you can read theologians on these things, and they give you diverse perspectives. And I don't profess to know these finally, but uh, over the years, I certainly have spent a few hours trying to grind on these things because they, uh, they're not that easy. And when you have to administer baptism and administer the Lord's Supper and seek to do so in faith and confidence and sincerity, uh, not easy. I remember the first time, I'll finish on this note, that I had to minister uh, baptism. And uh, it was about 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning before I had to administer it that at last I gained that peace of confidence and certainty to be able to go and to do that wholeheartedly in faith and with joy. Um, yeah, even though I'd read all the books and so on beforehand. Uh, there's, there's a great battle that goes on in these things. All right, let's finish on that note, shall we? Heavenly Father. We want to thank you that you have condescended to our weakness, not only to give us a word of promise, but also to give us signs, visible symbols that reflect the glorious spiritual realities the gospel holds before us. And even though there's dissension and division and difference of opinion on these things, Lord, help us to go beyond that, to embrace again the spiritual promises and blessings contained in the gospel, that we might grow in grace have our hope assured and look more and more to Jesus Christ, the mediator of covenant blessings. We ask this in his name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Ernie and Ben and Alan, good to have you online.